One of the first things I want to point out is that I think that we stand a much better chance of learning doctrine that changes behavior, of getting more rich and meaningful insight out of the text. If we approach it in the absence of the assumption that we already know what it is and is not allowed to say. When we approach the text devotionally, confessionally, frequently we're bringing some dogmas with us, some expectations about what is theologically appropriate and theologically correct. But I want to suggest that if we try to remove those, those interpretive lenses and try to allow the text to operate on its own terms, I think being made a little uncomfortable with the text is a wonderful way to get us out of our comfort zone in order to help us change our behavior. Because if we approach the text expecting that we know where the boundaries are and we know what the text is and isn't going to do, we're not really learning anything new so much as we're engaged in a type of confirmation bias. We're just looking to verify what we already think we know. And that's a comfortable way to approach the scriptures. That makes us feel better about our understanding of the scriptures in many ways. But it doesn't help us change. It doesn't help us grow a whole lot. And so one of the things that I try to help people think about when they're approaching the scriptures is to recognize that when we approach the scriptures, as Laurie has said, you know, it's not just a, a filmed account. It's not a verbatim account of what's going on that we just passively consume or that we're just passively exposed to. These texts are written in so that they can be engaged, so that they can inform experience and bring meaning to people's own experiences. And so every time that we bring our own experiences to the text, we're going to be negotiating with the text. And that's something that I say quite a bit on my different social media channels, that we're negotiating with the text because the text has no meaning in and of itself. The, the squiggles on a page, the sound waves traveling through the air, they're not carrying any metaphysical meaning or anything like that. And the potential meaning that they can be filled with is pretty extensive and pretty complex and pretty broad. And we create meaning as we engage with the text, as we bring our own experiences and our own understandings of the relationships that have been agreed upon between certain signs on a page, certain sounds, and certain semantic content. And the reality of this fact that texts and words don't have any meaning but are given meaning by readers and hearers and viewers is the main reason that People frequently misunderstand one another. Wives and husbands misunderstand each other all the time. Siblings, parents, children, co-workers, people we have been around our entire lives who have very similar experiences to our own, there are still fuzzy edges to the, the way we try to encode the thoughts in our heads, but there's never a one-to-one -one correspondence. And so the differences in those experiences, in those understandings, contribute to different interpretations. And the further removed we are from whoever is generating the text and from their experiences and their understandings of the relationships between semantic meaning and the languages that they're using, the more work we have to do in order to ensure that what the meaning that we're generating approximates what was intended rather than just us generating our own meaning. And when we're talking about the Bible, we're talking about a text that has been translated. And so we already have an intermediary, a translator, who is interpreting the source text themselves and then generating their own meaning. And then we have to then interpret the meaning that they have generated and then try to produce our own. And frequently, that can result in differences in meaning. And uh, the King James Version frequently can do that as well, because that translation is also quite outdated, and we frequently misunderstand it without even knowing. And a good example is the book of Jude, and there's only one chapter, and verse 22 says, but of some have compassion, making a difference. And if we <clears throat> try to think about what is going on here in this passage, mostly we're going to come up with a conclusion that what it's saying is, have compassion on folks, and it can exercise a positive influence. It can make a difference in their lives. And that's a wonderful message, but it also has absolutely nothing to do with what the King James translators intended to say, because that phrase, make a difference, did not come to refer to having a positive influence or impact on someone until around the year 1900. 
when the King James Version was translated in 1611, to make a difference meant to make a distinction, to exercise discernment. And so when that passage was translated in 1611, the idea was not have compassion and you can have a positive impact on someone. It was have compassion, but be discerning about that. And that's a very different message, but that's what was intended by the King James translators. Now, most translations you look up today won't say that either. They'll say have compassion on those who doubt or those who are separating themselves because the King James translators were relying on source texts that we now know were probably not the best, that were probably um, using that word in a different, in a different sense that was, than was intended. And we have better manuscripts now, and there's a different form of that word in these manuscripts that indicate that the making a difference is not a reference to the outcome of having compassion, but a reference to the objects of our compassion. On whom should we have compassion? Those who are trying to discern, those who are wavering, those who may be doubting. And that's just one simple illustration of how the fact that the messages, the stories, the life of Jesus are being mediated to us, not only by the storyteller themselves, by, but, but by the translations that we're using uh, can have a significant impact on how we understand those stories, which is one of the reasons I think that the work that McLean and that Lori and that others do to help us better understand everything that's going on in between the events that are being narrated and our consumption of those narrations, that goes a long way to helping us better understand. And that's a part of the negotiation that we must go through in order to get meaning from the text. Now, sometimes we don't approach the text because we want to understand the history better. Sometimes we may be approaching the text because we want to commune with the Spirit. We want to feel God's presence. And maybe we don't have to think that hard about the message. Maybe really we just need to be in the text. We just need to be imagining these events in order to feel the Spirit and to feel like we're communing with deity. And I've experienced this quite a bit when I'm, <clears throat> I'm working on a translation of the New Testament right now that's intended for about a 10-year-old readership. And so I'm trying to create a more simplified translation of the text. But in order to be able to articulate that translation in a way that's accessible and accurate, I have to try to insert myself to the the greatest degree possible into those situations, into that history, and try to get a sense for exactly what's going on so that I can then take those concepts that are in my head and articulate them in a way that's, that's understandable. But I think some of the most spiritual experiences I have had with scriptures have been stories from the New Testament and from the Gospels in particular related to the life of Jesus. And those experiences have been when I'm not really trying to figure out what is the author trying to do, but I'm just trying to experience the events. I'm just trying to insert myself in their world and just sit in that world for a little while and feel what's going on. And I've had the, the privilege to be able to go over to the Holy Land and to be able to see a lot of these sites and kind of physically insert myself into those settings and try to imagine uh, these events in that circumstance. And that has significantly in increased the reality, the closeness of those events for me. And so when I'm approaching the scriptures for that reason, I use a completely different method because I'm trying to get something different out of it. Now, when I'm approaching the scriptures to try to answer specific questions about what they're trying to say, what does Jesus mean by this parable? What does Paul mean by this example? There are quotations of other literature. There are a lot of different ways that the authors embed the text, encode the text with additional meaning that goes beyond just the words on the page. When I'm approaching it that way, I use a different methodology. I use a lot of additional resources. I use lexicons and I use study Bibles and commentaries and things like that. And so that's another, that's a different set of methods that you can use to try to understand more precisely what is being, what is being communicated. And Lori gave a wonderful example of using the, the frame approach to try to understand how the author of Mark is arranging the story so as to send a message 
And I think that the fact that there's two stages to the healing at the beginning and only one at the end, which doesn't involve any physical interaction whatsoever, is interesting in light of the fact that the disciples obviously understand something special about Jesus initially, but they don't receive their full sight really until after the resurrection. And that's what completes the healing. So they're their understanding of Jesus is also a two-phase process. And, you know, we don't see that message if we don't have some of those additional resources to help out. And and one wonderful resource that fortunately is going to be available shortly in paperback. Many years ago when I was at BYU, I helped some of the folks out there with a couple of volumes. One was called Jehovah and the World of the Old Testament, and the other was called Jesus and the World of the New Testament. And these were written by wonderful Latter-day Saint scholars who were putting together what is kind of like a coffee table book. It's a big illustrated book that helps to people to better understand the culture uh, in which these texts were written, better understand some of the literary devices, better understand the history, better understand some of the material culture, so that their engagement with the New Testament can be a lot more productive. So one of the questions I frequently get is, what resources should people check out to get more out of their New Testament study? And I think when this book is available in paperback, it should be shortly. I don't think it's out yet. But that would be a wonderful resource. Jesus Christ, Jesus in the World of the New Testament by, well, now Elder Holtzoffel, Eric Huntsman, and a couple of others. So that's a, a wonderful resource. And I would highly recommend as well uh, Tom Wayman's second edition of his new translation of the New Testament, which has a lot of explanatory notes that situate the text within a Latter-day Saint reading. And so for folks who want to engage a, a different translation and hopefully try to understand these texts uh, a little closer to how they were intended to be read. I think that's a, another wonderful resource. So if you're looking for resources out there to help you be able to negotiate in a more informed way with the text, those, those are a couple that I would highly recommend. But more than anything else, I would just recommend trying to think about why you're approaching the text, what you want to get out of your study of the New Testament, and then apply the tools that will make it so you're more likely to succeed. One of the things that I've always found very helpful, something that took me a long time to learn, was that the Gospels are not presenting, the our understanding of Jesus's life is not best achieved by adding up the Gospels. The Gospels are telling four different stories about Jesus's life, and they're telling them from different perspectives for different reasons and to different audiences. So they're presenting four different portraits of Jesus. And if we can learn to compartmentalize those portraits and engage each portrait on its own terms, I think we can understand better who the Jesus is that each author is presenting. Mark's Jesus is a much more basic story. In fact, there is a good case to make that it was written with the intent of being performed, that it was more of a play than something that was intended to be read. It's a basic story. We don't have any of Jesus's pre-existence, any of Jesus's childhood. We start there with the baptism, and it's a very humanistic portrait of Jesus. Matthew there's a good case to make that Matthew was writing their story in order to defend the perpetuation of the laws of Moses. And many scholars argue that Matthew was what we might call a Judaizer, someone who felt that Christianity was best lived in conjunction with the traditions and the rituals of Judaism. And that's why they say that heaven and earth, or that the neither a jot nor tittle of the law will fail until heaven and earth pass away, where if you go and look at Luke, Luke's not taking that perspective. Luke is taking a different perspective and says, it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one jot or tittle of the law to fail. And so they're, they're both referring to the same concept, but teaching it in very different ways. And Luke's Jesus is much more concerned with the marginalized of society. We have the story of the prodigal son. We have women taking a center role in uh, Luke's gospel more regularly. We have more about disabled. We have more about non-Israelites. There's more of a concern for the folks who are on the margins of society, and particularly Jewish society in the Gospel of Luke. And then in the Gospel of John, we have a very different presentation from the other three, which are referred to as synoptic Gospels. That's focused on love and Jesus's identity as the Word, as a divine figure who is mediating the presence of God 
to the rest of humanity. And when we can approach those gospels on their own terms and maybe dive into each one, trying to understand what the author is trying to say through that framework that we can bring to the text by understanding their rhetorical goals. I think that makes for a much more lively Jesus. It makes more makes for a Jesus, hopefully, with whom we can resonate more, we can understand better. And hopefully it helps us engage the, the text in a way that can help us find more meaning in our own experiences, can help us understand uh, how our own experiences are related to what's going on in the story. We hear stories a lot about people reading the Book of Mormon or the Bible over and over again, and each time they're underlining different things, they're understanding it differently. And that's because each time you're bringing a different set of experiences and circumstances and goals to the text, and that's going to influence the interpretive lenses we bring to the text. That's going to influence how we negotiate with the text, and that's going to influence how the stories work in our lives. So... My testimony is that the Bible is a living text, that it's going to be different every time we approach it, because we're going to be different every time we approach it. And if we can better understand that fact, and we can better understand what different lenses, what different experiences we're bringing to the text, and what different goals we have for our engagement with the text, we can much more productively negotiate with the text so that we are learning doctrine that changes behavior and so that we are growing each time we're approaching the text and so that we are growing closer and closer to God and to his son, Jesus. And that is my testimony that I share in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 